Good morning, Mr. Palmer. Once again, it's been like, uh, oh, I don't know, a hot minute since we've spoken. Yeah, something like that. I but everybody, I see the pen now. You're grooving, and now you got the pen. You're doing the air guitar and the air the air drums and everything. We're just gonna have one whole episode. And the beauty part is, nobody but me and and you can see this. One of these days, we'll we'll bring back YouTube. I think we I think we'll bring back video eventually. But you know, I used to have some drumsticks way back way back in my former life in my former day. I was a I was an aspiring musician, and I used to one of the things one of the in, instruments i used to play very poorly was the drums so i used to have i used to have drumsticks i used to i was in the i was in the marching band and i played the the quad drums which is that that guy who has like the four different drums in front of him on a rack you know mm -hmm. because he can't he can't just pick one he's got to be like i need options and i was terrible i thought i was really good the coolest thing that the, the thing that i used to love about that drum set the most i'll be honest with you was the fact that the damn thing pivoted right? So when you're marching and you're playing, it's all flat in front of you, but you could grab the front of it. You could rotate it up and it would really relieve a lot of the weight. And so I used to love rotating it up because I was like, I'm bad. I'm going to change my positions. And then I'd be like, you know, air drumming as I was walking down a street. And then when it was ready for me to go again, I'd slap those things down and I just go to town. So <laughs> probably uh, way now <laughs> So it's it's bad enough for anybody that knows Jim or follows Jim on Twitter. You have, and I know you have to keep this on until October, a picture of you with a chrome helmet. Yes. Dog of last year. Now, because you mentioned marching band, now I want to get you a, one of those hats. <laughs> and again, the benefit of video that nobody else has. I want to get you one of those marching band hats with the tall hats with the feathers on it. I'm going to make this happen. Phoenix 2024, <laughs> if we're both there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my goal. You bet you're going to ruin you know, the day. <laughs> I never, you know, we never had those hats because. Well, see, now I'm going to fulfill your, my, you missed out on the full, my, full experience. My, my school wasn't, we, we weren't funded enough, if I guess <laughs> is a nice way to say it, for the marching band to have um, the full like marching band outfit just because we just didn't have the funding. So we, we wore like t-shirts. We all had like, it was like, wear a red t-shirt. That was our, gonna, that was our uniform. We're going to, we're going we're gonna to get you the full marching band experience. Um, but so this is not a marching band podcast and we're back. Well, to stray dog, <laughs> but, but you know what though? I mean, it, it kind of ties in, right. Is because it's, it's, what do you do? Like in the, in, in my marching band career. Right. And I was, man, I was in marching band for six years. From so when I grew up, we had three years in junior high. We had junior high and high school. So we had three years in junior high and three years in high school. And we never, I was in marching band for six years. I think I started in marching band, but we never had the opportunity to because we never had the funding, we never had the money to do like a proper refresh. So it was just like we had uniforms and we did have them. We never wore them because the uniforms were like 30 years old. And half of them were missing. And so we couldn't ever complete a full, you know, a full thing. So we just kind of made do with what we had. And that's what I want to talk about today is, you know, what happens when you, you know, have to make do with what you had. And I think that's really apropos when we start talking about the, um, the, the idea of, of six gigahertz, because I think it's still new, right? Six gigahertz is still sort of this new idea, even though it's been out for a couple of years, but there wasn't a whole lot of six gigahertz APs. There wasn't a whole lot of six gigahertz clients. And so I think with Wi-Fi seven coming out and, you know, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more six gigahertz. And I'm, I want to talk about what happens to people who go, I have a Wi-Fi five. We're going to say an 11 AC wave one network. And I'm going to upgrade to Wi-Fi 7 now because it's, you know, I now have the funding. It's time to upgrade and I'm going to put in six gigahertz. What happens when you don't have the budget to do a whole brand new design and a brand new cable pole and all, everything else? What happens to your network? Ooh, it depends. <sighs> I finally get to know. No, I mean... <laughs> We have we've had this discussion, and, and, and a lot of different Wi-Fi professionals have had this discussion, and we've probably both lived this experience, right? It doesn't take any genius to get 
Wi-Fi gear, right? You know, you go out, you inherit a network, somebody buys you the gear, and you say, oh, just install it. One of the pieces that's always missing, or or not maybe not always missing, but a consistently a, a consistent theme that a theme that I've had is people don't invest in the in the surveys and the survey tools, right? And this is kind of where you're going at. Um, and my prior life, we had Wi-Fi, and for a long, long time, especially if anybody knows where I work worked, we farmed it out. We we had a you know a consulting firm do our our surveys for us. And when I finally kind of figured out what I was doing and knew what we were doing and wanted to do, I, I raised enough of a stink to get the gear to do it ourselves. Because I'm like, we're a small team, but we're not – it's not that hard to do if you know what you're doing. And we knew what we were doing, and we got the tools, and we could do it. Because when you, you farm out a, a survey, it gets expensive really, really fast. And I understand that getting the tools and, and things like that and the software and the licensing, especially the licensing nowadays, it can add up pretty quickly too. But if you don't survey – I mean, it's a crapshoot, to be blunt, right? And and, and the, the thing that a lot of people forget as Wi-Fi improves, and especially now that we're jumping from 5 to 6, I mean, you could do like a Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6. You could probably do a rip and replace and be okay. But if you're doing to 6 gigahertz, rip and replace becomes a little bit problematic. You know, and but and it's the same thing if you were going from like a 2.4 only network to 2.4 and five. You're going to have coverage gaps on the five gigahertz network if your prior deployment had been surveyed for 2.4, or really not even that. You, depending on how your survey was done, I should say, because use cases change, the technologies changed, the building might have changed, um, so it's really hard to tell. So I'm going to take you to task on a couple of things. One, you kept saying surveys. And I'm, I wrote a blog on my personal blog a few years ago about, you know, is the word survey dead? Because there was, you know, there's a whole big thing about survey actually means something. And too many times people talk about um, designs where they just simply guess at the walls and they put together a guesstimate on a design and they call that a, you know, a predictive survey. But it's not really a predictive survey unless you go out on site and you actually do some type of work to make it a survey. And so so there's there's the predictive design, which could involve like a full blown, I'm going to go on site and I'm going to measure the attenuation of every single wall to make sure that I know what I'm doing or what I'm designing. And then there's the guesstimate, you know, design, which is, I'm just going to assume that all the walls are three DB drywall attenuation. And I'm going to throw that in. I'm going to put my design in. And then there's the people that just go, look, the cable drops are where the cable drops are, and I'm not going to move them at all. And so I'm not even going to do any type of design you know, I'm just going to do a guesstimate pop and swap. And, you know, you're right. There was the, you know, it's going from a 2.4 only network to a, you know, 2.4 and five with a dual band. Now we're going to a tri band. And so it's something that worries me a lot because it's, I've been working on some Wi Fi 7 stuff. Um, you know, we've had some conversations with uh, some people about it. I've done some presentations and I'm, you know, we have we have it on the the schedule. We're going to do some more podcast episodes about Wi Fi Seven. But it's the the thing that scares me about Wi Fi Seven the most is the proliferation of six gigahertz and people not being prepared for what that means when they do their traditional pop and swap. Because I'm not going to spend the money to you know to fix anything else. I'm just going to pull out my you know. We'll say like an R600 and I'm going to put in an R whatever we six, whatever we come up with for the, the seven, the Wi-Fi seven naming convention. Um, You know, they're like, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put in that AP and then I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to be done. And it really, really scares me, John. No, I agree. I mean, <clears throat> it's up there with, and I've had this a couple of times in my past where somebody's like, well, we don't have the design. We don't know. We don't have the floor plans yet. Um, but we know it's going to be like 20,000 square feet. So how many APs? Oh. And I 
I mean, I've gotten to the point where I refuse to give numbers because, it, I mean, it, we're, we're, we're going to owe Sam a lot of money, but it depends because, and I, I've done this with a warehouse where they didn't literally didn't have a floor plan. They're like, well, we need to know how many EPs to order. I'm like, well, I need to know the, sh- the shelves and the layout because I don't know what it's going to look like and how, the, you know, are they going to be floor to ceiling? Are they going to be fully stocked? Is it going to be the entire building floor to ceiling shelves? Like, that could be 100 APs. That could be two. Like, where do you want the wireless cover? Like, it, it all depends. But that's that's a different, I think that's a different uh, rabbit hole. One of the biggest, and I touched on it a little bit, I know, I think this is kind of where you were going with it, is the cost, right? So for every big organization that wants to do Wi-Fi right, they should be able to afford, whether it's their own survey tools, uh, survey, whatever, nomenclature can change, I don't care, the tools to do the job, right? They should be able to afford it. And if they can't afford it or they don't have the team to do it, they can farm it out. There are plenty of, of third-party partners, integrators that do this work. Some do it better than others, but, <clears throat> you know, there's there's options. Um, like I said, if you're going from 5 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz, no harm in doing as you do. What would you, what's your uh, – I do a rip and replace. You do pop and drop? What is it? Pop and swap. Pop and swap. Um, <clears throat> there's no harm in that. But – you know, and, and there's there's metrics out there, and I, I can't I don't have any in front of me. And I'm not going to go hunting because this is just a stray dog shorty. But uh, you know, 2.4. I'm hearing Keith Parsons in my ear. 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and 6 gigahertz don't cover any further or less than the other. They they all travel the same amount of distance. If you point them all to the moon, they're all going to get there at the same time. They propagate differently through material is where, where the difference comes in. So anybody listening that's, that's going for basics, I'm, am I being a pedantic person about that? Yes. But 2.4 does not cover any further than 5 gigahertz. It propagates different. Um, and I can get crucified all I want. I don't really care. But 6 gigahertz does the same thing. So from a coverage in the real world perspective, you're going to get less coverage from a 6 gigahertz signal than you are from a 5 gigahertz than you are from a 2.4. You're going to need more 6 gigahertz APs or 6 gigahertz radios than you're going to need of the 5 or the 2.4 variety. And there's no ratio. I'm sure somebody probably has a ratio. I'm not a fan of a one-size-fits-all kind of slide rule for that because it depends. You could have a very dense building, a lot of, you know, a lot of walls breaking up the signals, and you might need an AP in nearly every room to get adequate 6, six gigahertz coverage, but you need that survey. You need to have that that information on site from the tools gathered to tell you what you need. Or after the fact, go back and validate and say, okay, the coverage in this room is exactly what I was hoping to get out of it. This is great. Or, wow, this is really bad. I can't use six gigahertz in this classroom anymore. I, I need to I need to add an AP or move an AP or adjust something. Um, and you know, and I've seen people talk about it on the Wi-Fi messaging boards. Um, and there's different boards that I trust more than others. And there's more, there's different people that I trust more than others. And, and I've seen people comment that, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not that much difference, you know, and, and those are on the boards I don't trust from the people I don't know, <laughs> but the people that I know and the people that I trust have all been coming back with the same thing recently because they've started doing Wi-Fi six um, or not Wi-Fi six, but uh, six gigahertz six AP, AP on a stick. And, and it's been, it's been like, wow, can you believe, you know, and, and, and if you don't know an AP on a stick is the idea that you basically take a test AP, you put it on a, on a stick, on a, on a telescopic pole and you, and you put it in an environment and then you survey, you actually walk around with the device that measures the signal and you keep walking until you get to, you know, a signal level that you don't care about anymore. Don't, don't just stop it. Hey, well, I want to see how far my neg 65 gets, you know, where do I go at neg 65? When you do these AP on a stick surveys, you need to go out to where you don't care about the signal because there's that, you have the, the, the care or, or want, don't want, don't care. And the don't want part is really critical when we start talking about um, CCI. And that usually exists between about a neg 67 and a neg 90. So you really have to survey, you know, keep walking in that circles and walking around the AP going further and further and further until you get to about a neg 90. But they're doing this. And what they're discovering is, is that the signal level that they want is so much smaller, you know, than what they 
had anticipated and from what they thought. And I did a video or I didn't do the video, but I talked about the video at Mobility Field Day 9. And one of the things that I had to glance over really, really quickly was this idea that we're putting 6 gigahertz in with Wi-Fi 6E without an AFC. And that means we're running low power indoors, LPI. Now, you can say it. You can go, oh, yeah, LPI was, you know, 12 dB, 12 dBm, sorry. And, you know, and you go, oh, my my other one was at 22. So it's 10 dB difference, right? So it until you actually see that in the real world, it's one thing to say the numbers. It's another thing to actually see what that looks like when you when it's actually surveyed. The coverage difference is astronomical. And one of the things I'm noticing within my neighborhood, and this is sort of a very specific to just me, um, I was using my uh, six gigahertz monitoring off my WLAN Pi and and uh, Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. And I noticed that all of my neighbors now have the new um, ISP router because it's all this this new manufacturer I've never heard of before. And it's all new and they all have the, the hidden SSIDs and they all have the all that stuff. And so I know it's all of all of the ISP stuff. And I can see a ton of five gigahertz SSIDs from all of my neighbors. I can see one six gigahertz. Now, I know the six gigahertz exists because it's all coming off. It's all the same router, right? It's the same model. So I know they all have it because they all upgraded to get the faster Wi-Fi. And yet I can't see, I can only see one SSID outside of my house. Whereas at five gigahertz, I can see 40. So there's go, there is a huge difference in that ability to cover. And I know you said you hate the square footage thing and I hate the square footage thing, but there is a significant difference in how much square footage you can cover when you go from a standard power, I hate saying standard power, but you go from a full power five gigahertz radio to a, a low power indoor six gigahertz. I'm very concerned that people are going to start just throwing in these Wi-Fi 7 APs and they're all going to have the ability to do six gigahertz and it's going to massively underperform and they're going to blame everybody except themselves for not doing the proper design. No, and I, I should I should sort of reiterate. I don't I don't think either one of us hates the square footage thing particularly. It's there's no one size fits all answer where you can sit there and say for every there's... 150 square feet you need an AP. It's it's the same thing with the old and the the, the running joke within the Wi-Fi community that oh one AP per classroom. And the, the pushback has been especially more and more lately is it depends because at the end of the day a good Wi-Fi professional should have access to the tools and access to the knowledge, whether you, I mean, this is basic stuff going back to, you can get in the RCWA, you can get in the CWNA, you can get in the CWDP, um, but it's basic skills to do the design. And you have to look at the floor plan you're given, understand the requirements and design to that. Um, so if the call, if the design calls for one AP per classroom, then so be it. I've literally been doing college visits with my kids and I've seen colleges um, in larger, not even what I would really consider large, but large-ish uh, kind of sort of auditorium settings where they've probably had 40 or 50 kids in there um, and they had two to three APs. And on the one hand, you might think that's overkill, but they weren't beefy APs. And I don't know, it wasn't our stuff, so I, I didn't bother to look up the model number and understand what it was rated for. But it could be one of those things where the designer figured out that, you know, they need, you know, one, maybe it's tertiary coverage. Maybe they they have an issue where, like, they... they they need to make sure that if one AP fails, they still have got it two, and they only want, you know, 30 devices per. And again, with you're not designing for the people. You're designing for the devices. And when you look at the, the, the survey numbers, the not Wi-Fi survey, but the actual uh, the marketing numbers, if you will, uh, they're like three and four devices per person is not unheard of. I mean, I'm sitting at my desk. My, wire, my wa watch is wireless. My phone is wireless. My ta uh, iPad is not here. Uh, but if it is, that's wireless. I've got my laptop. That's four devices for me, um, just like, like that. So if you put a classroom in college or high school, you've probably got kids with three and four devices. And if you've got 30, dev 30 people in a room, that could be 100 devices. So you need to design for the devices, not the people. Um, but where I was going with that is um, you design for the requirements, right? And But to your point, six gigahertz, you can't do a rip and replace because you're going to have massive coverage gaps. And 
it's the the old mentality. I think we still see it where people are like, oh, Wi-Fi is simple. I don't want to sound like the, the gatekeeper, but you need to know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, it can be very expensive for you to do what you don't know what you're doing. And then somebody has to come in and fix it. Um, but when you think about it, right, like 10, 15 years ago, Wi-Fi was just a nice to have. Now it's the only way people can connect for, for, for most parts of the world, right? Like the new iPads, the new, well, forget it, the iPads, the new MacBooks, all the, the latest, not even Apple stuff. A lot of the computers nowadays don't have an Ethernet jack. It doesn't exist. And you're bringing the laptops to the classrooms. You're not plugging in. Your Wi-Fi is mission critical. So, you know, on the one hand, people can try to do it without paying for the, the tools or the, the expert to do it. But um, to me, it's like a fool's errand. Um, it's it's one of those where it needs to be done and it needs to be done right. And yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I going back to the last stray dog, right? I I was at a property last year that swore up and down they were not. Um, they were in the middle. They hadn't done a redesign yet, and I could tell that they were running one of our newer APs because I could see it because I had. I'm a nerd. I've got the tools, um, and they swore up and down that they hadn't deployed it yet. I'm like, I'm literally looking at it. I've got the you know, the feedback, I've got the Mac address, I've got everything, I know what it is. Um, but it was very clear that they had done a rip and replace without a resurvey, without a redeployment, without any adjustments. You know, they had 20 APs, they probably needed 24 APs in the new design based on 6 gigahertz, but they didn't add. Um, and then they had a coverage gap issue. So um, it's what, penny wise, pound foolish? It really is what it boils down to. You're going to find people that are trying to do the rip and replace, the pop and swap, and save money by not resurveying, by not redesigning and understanding where the, the things are going to need to be. And like you said, they're going to wind up sitting there saying six gigahertz is horrible. This is a really bad network. I mean, how many times do we do it? I mean, I'm sure if we ask somebody that's done these a lot more than we do, a lot of the times people are going to complain about a wireless network, and it has nothing to do with, like... The Wi-Fi was bad. It was it was misconfigured. It was a poor design. The design was poorly executed. Things like that. Very easily fixed if people trusted the experts and, and let them do their work. Yeah, I'm going to close with one thing that you said, and it, and it sort of sent a, a chill down my spine. And so I'm going to say it out loud, and then we can wrap this up. You were talking about education, and we just finished our – we just did you know two episodes with Ryan McKaig about um, K-12 and education Wi-Fi. And one of the big topics in the first, in part one, was the idea of one AP per classroom. And, and you know, and hopefully we've kind of gotten away from that. But then I started thinking about the, you know, the idea that since we know that low power indoor, six gigahertz APs, even if you, even at, you know, the low power indoor is limited to say 12 dBm and you designed your five gigahertz for 14 or 15 dBm. We're talking about a three dB difference, which is half. So this thing's running at half of the transmit power, even at, you know, at three dB, that's the dB math. Are we getting to the point where we might be going back to the one AP per classroom for six gigahertz? Does that, the six, and I, I don't have the answer. But he sent a shiver down my spine when you when you were talking about the one AP per classroom. And I was thinking, I was like, wait a second. We might be back to one AP per classroom. And I and it scares me to think that because one AP per classroom at five gigahertz and 2.4, and even I think a standard power does not work. But are we going to see that push again? Are we going to see the push from the people who are selling, you know, Wi-Fi designs on Fiverr, you know, be like, Hey, I'll do a Wi-Fi design for your entire business for $30 type of thing. You know, are we, are we back to that point to where, you know, we're going to see a prolifer proliferation of the one AP per classroom because of the six gigahertz low power indoors and six gigahertz attenuating differently. 
and it scares it scares the pants off of me. <laughs> well, thank God this is a video, an optional podcast. I, I uh, know. Um, <laughs> so, not to give everybody a, a graphic image or anything, but no, I mean it, it's a valid concern, um, and I think. I mean, that's why you and I both have stressed, like, it depends. It, we beat that to death. Um, but it, it does depend. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're talking about doing a deployment and you've never done 6 gigahertz before, um, if you're a Ruckus customer, talk to your SE. Um, Ruckus has design tools built into it uh, or, or built into the solution. And our SEs should have the ability to help you, you know, make some correct decisions. I understand that not everybody has... The, the you know whether it's Hamana or Ekahau or Ran Plan or IB Wave or I'm going to forget a couple, but there's you know there's a number of different um, you know and I, and I left out some of the more budget friendly options too not by choice or on purpose or anything like that. There's five or six different tools that you can do designs with, none of which are Red Solo cups. Um, there's no substitute for spending the time and the money either on the tools and the training or on somebody who has the tools and the training to do this right. Um, you spend a little bit more in the beginning and it's, it's going to work out better. It's the old measure twice cut once. Um, and that applies with Wi-Fi as well. Um, you know, if, if the design calls for one per classroom, then so be it. Um, like I said, I was in at least one classroom that had three. Um, I don't know the design requirements. I don't know what went into that. I don't know, you know, was one of them dead and I didn't realize it. And it was just, they never took it down. I don't know, but I did leg legitimately saw three and it was not, I mean, I've been in some big auditoriums and it was not a big auditorium. The design is going to call for what the design is going to call for, but you have to trust, trust, but verify. So it could, it very well could. Uh, that's, that we'll scares me that I just thought of that. I mean, the, the design, the fact that we could be back there doesn't scare me. The fact that somebody might say that and use that as a selling point, that scares me because somebody, and the reason this is going to sound pedantic and gatekeeping or whatever, but, and this is why I hate the square footage templates and things like that, because it's not one size fits all. I could design a building and I could verify it with my tools and say it's one, it's literally one AP per classroom with a few exceptions. And it just happens to be that. And then somebody's going to grab that and say, I've got a school coming up. It's going to be the last one we built with him is one AP per classroom. I'm not even going to call him. We're just going to put one AP per classroom. And then they call me opening day and they're like, this is horrible. The kids can't connect. What do we do? And I'm like, well, I didn't touch this building. So I have no idea what you did. And you look at it and it's like, okay, well, you need a one AP per every other classroom or you needed two APs in some classrooms because they were so big and some of the rooms have tall ceilings and the APs are too far away. It's the importance of design and it's the importance of walking the space. We talked about this before, you know, understanding where things go, understanding what you're working around because you could sit there. You and I can sit here from our desks in Colorado and New York and say, I want this AP there and I'm pointing at nothing because nobody can see me. But like on my map, on my blank floor plan, it looks like a perfect spot to drop an AP. But when you go out there and you look at it, there's exposed beams and it's duct work and it's you can't run a cable there. So the closest you're going to get a, an AP to that spot is 10 feet away. Well, that's what you get. But that's the importance of doing the, the, the right processes. And, and you've just got to trust your people. All right. Well... I need to go into therapy. <laughs> so. I'm going to have a shirt printed up for you, Jim. <laughs> but I think we beat this horse. So. No animals were harmed in the filming of this podcast. Sure. You say that. <laughs> my my oh, dog's man. been, my dog's been next to me snoring the whole time. So hopefully it doesn't show up or no, you don't I hear don't it. Even know. <laughs> Didn't hear it at all. Okay. All right, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jim.